So have you ever just wondered, am I important? Do, am I even noticed? Am I, if I just disappeared, would it make any difference in the world? I'm sure we've all had those moments, but something about the love of God, when we understand the love of God, it changes everything. And so even in the moments of confusion or in the moments of the in-between, we can know that God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. I'll never forsake you. And he is always, always pursuing us with his love. I remember hearing someone say one time that God, there's nothing we can do that would make God love us less or more. It's already such an abundant, amazing, inexhaustible love that our human brain can barely even comprehend it. But we're going to be talking about that, what it means to be fiercely loved. And I'm so excited because I have my special guest with me today, Lisa Bevere. You know her. She's all over the place. New York Times bestselling author, speaker, an amazing leader, and an amazing godly woman. And she's going to be talking about the love of God. Thank you so much, Lisa, for being with us today. Oh, Hannah, I'm so delighted to talk about this. Oh, I love this. And that this is a topic you could not exhaust, first of all. Right. And I really believe this is the one thing that is the most life-changing that I think is often glossed over. We start talking about his grace, his mercy, his, um, you know, how he can bring something new out of something old, his his compassion. But once we really understand the love of God, that's why the Bible says, if as I, my prayer for you is that you can stretch your mind around the height, breadth, depth, width of this love of God. But so you were talking about this in your book, Fiercely yeah. Love. What led you to that? Yeah. So I found most people feel fiercely judged, not fiercely loved. And mm. so when they think that God is thinking about them, they think he is disgusted, disengaged, disappointed, that he is looking for a reason to disqualify, that he is looking for a reason to opt out of a relationship with them. And when I was hearing the different things from different people, I thought, you know what? It is time that we change the way we think God is thinking about us. And one of the things that was so profound to me, and I, it's actually my husband that first kind of shared this uh, scripture with me, was, you know, basically this idea about a God who is always thinking good thoughts about us. Because I don't know what kind of household you grew up in, but I don't think my parents were always thinking good thoughts towards me. And, you know, oh, honey. And I can 100% guarantee and, and, and with all, much evidence. Yes, in all fairness, they, they have reasons to not be thinking right. good thoughts about me. But right. here's, here's the way God thinks about us. In Psalm 139, verses 17 through 18, it opens up with how precious to me are your thoughts, oh God. Okay, and they said, how vast the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. So a, a few weeks back, we endeavored to jam our entire family into a very small cottage. Um, none of the, they like the chaos. Now John's freaking out, but I took my grandkids to the beach with my daughter-in-law. And you know, I forgot there's an art to be able to shove up a bucket full of sand and flip it really fast. And my my sweet little eight-year-old granddaughter, she kept trying to flip it and it was breaking apart. It was either too wet or too dry. And I watched as these sand crystals were falling off. And I thought, I can't even number the sand, the grains of sand in that bucket, let alone looking up and down this beach. And so what is God saying? He is giving us a picture that his thoughts towards us are thoughts of good, thoughts of love, thoughts of rescue, thoughts of restoration, thoughts of discipline. He doesn't discipline us because he hates us. He disciplines us okay. because he loves us. And it's, they're innumerable and constant. So even when we are sleeping, he is thinking. 
And, you know, I just found there's just way too much awareness of uh, wrong and way too much right. awareness and of self-condemnation. You know, I don't know about you, but I got saved when I was 21 years of age. And then I continued to pray again and again and again and again. Like, what if I, oh, wait, I cussed, I cussed. I, I might've just like lost my salvation. Well, the truth is God had chosen me before I ever turned my heart towards him. God had loved me with an everlasting love before I ever even understood how to receive that love. And so the moment my heart turned towards him, he began to work in my life to remake me by his love, which includes discipline, which includes yeah. I'm going to consume those things that are going to unmake you, Lisa. And, and a lot of times we don't, we don't understand that, but think about how we love our kids. We love yeah. our kids into the best version of what we see in and on their lives. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so, I was uh, thinking about this, Lisa, the other day when I was talking to someone, because I think love is the cure for everything that pulls us out of alignment, you know, out, out of that godly kingdom alignment that we can live in. I think, I think everything that pulls us out, love is what aligns us back up to that. And I was talking with someone and they were very stressed out about something. And I was, you know, helping them understand, well, you know, we need to release that and let that go. And that's not serving you. And they literally said, I'm just a worrier. That's just me. And I, and I said, okay, so let's talk about this because <laughs> I mean, it's like owning it, you know, it's like, that's my badge. I got it right there. Uh, but, but I remember sharing that Jesus said, cast your cares upon me for I care for you. I said, the one thing that is causing you to be for I care for you, <laughs> for I care for you is that you forgot about that last part for mm -hmm. I care for you. Mm -hmm. Now, if we don't trust the love of God, how do we yield everything over to him? How do we cast our cares? How do we take all that worry that we're holding and trying to take, you know, being the source to fix everything and saying, you know what, I can just relinquish this to the love of God. We can't do that unless we first understand, wait, he cares for me. Therefore I can cast my cares. And that's, I think that Good. not understanding how fiercely we're loved is what stands in the way. You know, um, and I want to go back to something that you just talked about, you know, love is the only thing that endures, you know, it says no. now these three things, faith, hope, and love. Uh, but love is the only one that endures. And, and when you look at what's going on in our world, our motive has to be love. So everybody that's so mad at everybody, if their motive isn't love, even though they're right, they can be wrong. And, yeah. and, and you know, so love always wants to uh, believe the best, wants to see the best. Now, love, again, I'm, I'm not talking about correction. I'm not talking about accountability. Those are all loving actions, but love needs to be our motivation. And, you know, sometimes I, I don't, you probably don't ever do this, Hannah, but sometimes, oh my goodness, I'm on my phone and I want to say something that feels really profound or really just, and God's like, what's your motive, Lisa? Right. Is your motive to shame other people? Is your motive to prove yourself right? Or is your motive love? You know, even when it's talking about Jesus flipping over the tables, he did it out of love for his father's house, love for his father, and love for the people that religion had put into bondage. But I right, will never right. love others until I've experienced love. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, we'll hear, oh, yeah, I know God loves me. God loves me. God, it's white noise because we have not experienced the love of God. But once you've actually experienced, and I, I want people to, to know that, I mean, I was a super heathen, got saved, but I didn't get saved because I was awareness of my sin. I got saved because somebody told me that God loved me and I knew who I was. And I knew what I had done. Yeah. And I thought, if this God can love me. And then, you know, times in worship, times in worship alone. This is probably not going to happen in church alone. I have felt the presence and tangible awareness of the love of God. 
but we have to let him love us because yeah. we are often the ones that really hate ourselves. Like I can, I can flash back to being a young mom and having four kids. And every night I went to bed with a list of everything I hadn't done enough of. I yelled, I didn't do this. And I felt, and I felt like if I could punish myself enough, feel guilty enough, hold that weight on my chest long enough, then I would make the change. But the change doesn't come by me being the sacrifice. The change comes by me knowing I deserve judgment, but I'm going to get mercy. I'm going to receive the love of God and I'm going to walk into a way of truth. And I just feel like when, when I did fiercely love, I felt like we had to do it in a devotional format because people, their brain takes time to go yeah. from this idea that God is first and foremost thinking good thoughts about him, not thoughts of judgment. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean there's not consequences. Again, you know, I feel like I have to put a qualifier on everything with the, uh, this beautiful cancel culture win. But here's, <laughs> here's the truth. Uh, God is love. I have love. I have love, but I'm not love. Is love. God is. It's his essence. God is love. And, you know, I heard this a long time ago. It was, um, and I'm not going to say the name because I think I'm going to misquote it. But the, the beautiful man that was the Holocaust survivor said the opposite of love is not hate. He said the opposite of love is indifference. And here's the thing. God is not indifferent about us. Right. That is so good. His love, that is who he is. And I think that's one thing. I love how you're clarifying this. These are consequences, but it has nothing to do with love. Like the, that, like we were talking about that the other day, this is, you know, weird family conversations. You know how they, they get. And we were talking about how sin does not send you to hell, rejecting the love of God. Like so many people think, oh, you sin and go to hell. It's like, no, no, that's nothing to do with it. It's actually like, we're all sinners. And that was that love that loved us in sin is what compels us to now want to desire to be more like him. Because when you understand this love, he who did not spare even his own son, but freely gave him up for us, all will he not freely give us all things. This love where we can now just really collapse into that love and understand that we're safe there. I think a lot of people have this idea because of their human relationships, like where they come from or past relationships with you know, a marriage or, or any kind of relationship, that love has to be earned. We have to be worthy of it. But we don't realize that with God, he loved us before we ever knew him. And that love is what draws us. And your story of when you um, first became a believer and, and first asked Jesus into your heart, that moment, it was love that pulled you in. And I remember for me, Lisa, it was that moment. I was just a little kid and we had just um, seen the musical Godspell. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Oh, that. yeah. Are you, okay. are you old enough to have seen Godspell? Oh, I, I'm in my 50s, babe. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. But, um, and so I remember I was this little kid and, and my parents had bought the album I was listening to and it was that part where Jesus is dying. And that's when it hit me. And I was like, wait, he didn't have to. Yeah. And my sister walks in the room and I am bawling my ass. And she's like, are you okay? I was like, I just, he loves me so much that that love hits me. And then realize it has nothing to do with my worth or my value. It's just simply because I am and because he is. And yeah. that's, we're safe there. We're safe in that love. You know, John and I like to say it this way. The cross determines where we spend eternity. So the mm -hmm. cross settles things, but our choices determine how. So uh, our choices, I mean, there's rewards. I mean, people don't like to read these things, but, but they're in the Bible that there's rewards. And then there's people that are going to be saved uh, by fire. You know, I mean, it's just like everything they did, they didn't do it out of a motive of what? Love. Right. So the Corinthians tells us, if I, you know, if I give all I have to the poor and have not love, nothing. If I have this incredible gift of prophecy, have not love, 
nothing. If, if I have faith to move mountains, have not love. No, I mean, he goes through the whole thing. He ends yeah, up, yeah. With, if I deliver my body to be burned, I'm like, could, could we not get a bonus for that? <laughs> half, this half, might, uh, looks like some Starbucks points or I something. Mean, nothing. <laughs> and have not love, it profits me Profit. nothing. So we have to get this love thing right. Because if we don't do the love thing right, there is nothing. There is nothing. It also says that they're going to know we're Christians by our love one for another. You know, in any given moment, you can go online and you can find one leader talking oh. back about another leader, exposing another person, yeah. condemning yeah. another person. And, and the world's like, why would I want to be part of that? Right, right. I want to know we are Christians by our love one for another. Not our right. doctrine, not our theology, not our amazing music, not our borderline bad movies. It says they're going to know we are <laughs> Christians. You said it, I did. I did you say it. it. It's by our love one for another. <laughs> and, you know, I just feel like the Christians are always, I don't know why, like, seriously. Why, can't why we do we look like the world? Why are we looking like the world? Well, we, we actually want the approval of the world. And I feel like the, the spirit of the Lord is dealing with the fear of man right now. And, and, oh, yeah. uh, and the only opposing force to the fear of man is the fear of the Lord. And we get to choose what we are going to fear. Are we going to fear people? Or are we going to fear God? If we're going to fear God, we're going to tremble at his word. You know, it said that, that Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. So this is right. not an Old Testament thing. This is a, a New Testament that I'm going to love what God loves. I'm going to hate what God hates, not who. I'm going to hate what God hates because everything that God loves is about uh, like protecting those he loves. And everything God hates is about protecting those he loves. And so the things that God hates are division, slander, Pride. He knows that pride unmakes us. Oh. When evil is called good and good is called evil, unjust measures. These are all the things that God hates. He hates when a woman is unloved in a marriage. I mean, this is how who God is. He loves. He loves. And so he doesn't like anything that makes him look contrary to who he is, anything that undermines his image or distorts ours. Right, right. I love that because it is really, uh, really getting centered on who we are in him. Mm -hmm. Like when your identity starts to meld into the identity of God, there's, yes. and, and all of a sudden the lines are blurred. I mean, Jesus knew his father so well, and he trusted the love that he said, I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. I don't say anything unless I hear my father say it. And the, the works I do are not of my own, but they are the father in me doing the works. Like he knew everything that was going to create something lasting here on this earth yes. was going to come from that source that he could trust that love source. And I really think when we learn how to forget the human explanation of love, that, you know, well, you know, as long as, as long as they show up the way I want them to show up, or as long as they're serving me, or as long as, you know, this marriage is 50, 50 or whatever, we have so distorted what that, what love is. If we can abandon that human definition, how we've been culturalized and open ourselves up to a new definition of this love that is so immense, we can get lost in it and be safe there. I think that will change the game. I think I think people will abandon stress. People will be um, open to relationships. There will be just like you said, intimacy instead of division. There will be compassion instead of judgment. It all. I think what we do when when we are demonstrating those things that God hates, what we're doing is we're operating outside of love. We're yeah. not letting love make decisions for us. Yeah, and I think that's just a good uh, gauge for every single person. You know, am, if I'm in a disagreement with my husband, do I want to be right or do I want to be loving? And at the end of the day, sometimes love overlooks certain things. At the end of the day, sometimes love confronts things. I had to confront something recently <clears throat> that I knew that if I confronted it, 
it was going to cost me one relationship, but it would be unloving to not protect another relationship. And so we have to make a choice. Am I self-preserving or am I operating in love? And I think every single day that we are not walking in love, we're actually captive to fear because I don't yes. think the opposite of fear is faith because I can have faith in my fears. I can believe that something bad is going to happen and it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah, girl. The opposite of fear is love. Because right. the Bible says that perfected love casts out fear. So it has to be the opposing force. And so is it self-love or am I loving my neighbor as myself? And this whole idea that, well, I just got to love myself. Well, listen, I can look in the mirror at Lisa and say, Lisa, you are a hot mess. I do not love you. But when I look in the mirror of God's word, right. all of a sudden, I see how he loves me and I receive his love in spite of me. So this nonsense about I'm more than enough. No, you're not. Without Jesus, you are not more than no, enough. Great. Christ, you are more than enough. And so people are kind of taking themselves outside of the cross, outside of identity in Christ and, and calling themselves good. And you know, it's interesting. That's kind of the, the rich young ruler dynamic yeah. of Jesus. Good yeah. teacher. What does he say? No one is good but God. So, you yeah. know, Jesus was God, but we got to be really careful when people look at themselves or if somebody says to me, oh, you know, you, you're just so good. I have to say, yeah, that's, that's not actually who I am outside of Christ. Right. If I don't have my life submitted to the word of God and to the love of God, I am not a nice person. I am not a kind person. I am self-centered and I am selfish. And that is basically all of us before we get saved. Right. And then as we get saved, we renew our mind. And as we renew our mind, the word of God judges our thoughts and intents, our motives of our heart. And if I actually understand that I am fiercely loved, that I can in turn love other people. Right. That's so beautiful. Lisa, I want to touch back on something you said, because I think that's important that we just, we touch on this before we wrap this up, is that our culture right now is trying to have the effects without having the cause. We want to feel confident. We want to feel more than enough. We want to feel self-actualized, like all the lingo, right? But if it's not backed up in the word of God, like you said, love is the only thing that endures. So when we're trying this thing, that means we're going to have to try it over and try it over and try it over and try it over. That's why you see these people as repetitive, like, okay, now I need to go on this voyage and now I need to do this thing and now I need to say this thing and now I need to go on this retreat. It's like, no, ground it, <laughs> ground it in the word of God. Yeah. So that way it's not this loop that isn't supported, but now it's the foundation of growth that can go from grace to grace, from favor to favor. And that can only be founded in God's word. That's yeah. why when you yeah. say, when you look in God's word and see yourself, how he sees you, that's grace that's mercy. Yeah. And I believe grace empowers us. So, you know, I love that Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He's not saying, if you love me, you'll prove it by keeping my commandments. He's saying, if you fall in love with me, then you'll be empowered to keep my commandments. And so a lot of times we, we get the grace and mercy terms mixed up. We, we think grace covers everything. Well, grace is not what covers everything. No, Mercy no. covers everything. Mercy is when you and I don't get what we deserve. And so what, when we see the mercy of God on our lives, and that's basically what happened with me. I saw the love and I realized the mercy. And when those two things, the love and the mercy joined together, I received the grace, not according to my past, not according to my works, not according to my scriptural knowledge, I received the grace to become a daughter of the most high God. I, I, I remembered that I was no longer a number, but he called me by name. And I think a lot of times we hide behind labels when God is saying, I want an intimate relationship with you. This mm -hmm. isn't about what you do. This isn't about the church you're a membership of. I am calling you by name. Hannah, I love you. And, and you know, I 
and, and, and I know this sounds silly, but I think we measure ourselves wrong. I have never been in prayer and had my heavenly father say, wife of John Bevere. I've never had him say, mother of four sons. I've never had him say, New York Times bestselling author. Do you think God cares about how many books I sell? <laughs> I mean, he really doesn't. He cares about how many books I sell. And so there's this Ooh, completely Lord. different economic system in heaven than there is here. So who I am to God is daughter. What I do with that is my response to his mercy and how he has graced me is he graces me to obey. He graces me to have fruit. He prunes me so I have more fruit, which y'all know pruning is not fun, but pruning yeah. is necessary. And I feel like right now God is pruning his body so that his body will begin to produce more fruit. So I feel like there's a shaking. I feel like there is a sifting. I, I, I felt like, <clears throat> I, I felt the imagery of panning for gold. Like there's, yes. he's doing this. He's just, he's, he's just shaking and he's, he's sifting, sifting, shaking, shaking. And when it's done, he'll pull out the gold and then he's shifting positions. He's, he's putting things into place. And I, I feel like right now we have to be really careful uh, with what's going on. I feel like there's a lot of people he's shaking that they're going to come out gold. They're, he's he's yeah. going to, he's going to like rub these things off. Then there's other people he's shaking and he's like, you've, you've misused this. You're, you're going, you're going over here on the sideboard for a while. I mean, but, but God is the one doing it. And yeah. so um, I personally uh, just have such a sense that we have to be grounded in the love of God so that we are slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to wrath. Oh, that's so beautiful. I sense it too, Lisa. There is definitely a shaking, and there is no better word to describe that. I see it in, in ministries. I see it in businesses. I see it in, in families. I see this happening right now. There's everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything. Everything. Media, culture. There is a shaking, and God will be God. And yeah. I think now more than ever, we have got to understand and have a reverence for that. And when, and that's, that's, that will never change. His love will never change. Yeah. But, but his love does understand. consume. And, and what? His, his love can consume. So like, right. I, I personally think it would be one of our greatest prayers to say, you know, all consuming fire, you know, that the God is an all consuming fire. He is love, but he is also He's also you know, this consuming fire. So he's both of those things. <laughs> Say, come into my life yeah. and consume everything okay. that hinders your love from being seen. Yes. Consume everything in my life. And, and we, it starts personally. And, and, and then it works out to our, our marriages, our families, our cities. That, that when, but it's scary when, when yeah. God begins to pull something out of your hand that you've had the wrong place, when he's beginning to, to deal with idols in our lives, the things that we've given our strength to, drawn our strength from, and he's like, baby girl, this, this no, it's, it's gonna end up hurting you. You know, we yeah. think, oh, my hands are empty. And, and we think that's a, a bad posture, but God mm -hmm. is saying, that's just where I want you to be so I can pour out. Yes. And nothing will help us yield to that refinement mm -hmm. and to that pruning and to that shaking, except yeah. the love of God, because yeah. when we know he loves us, then we can trust him. And with that trust comes a yielding to God. That's when we can really pray, search me, oh God, and know my hearts. Mm -hmm. see, see if there, my heart, see if there's any wicked way in yeah. me, lead me in the way everlasting. Like when that becomes our prayer, it's like, whatever is in me, that is not of you. I want it out. Yeah. And we, we have one that. chance with an assurance, casting our cares on him because he cares for us. We know that we can pray that because he loves us. And because he loves us, we can surrender to him. And, um, and again, I think it's going to be the love of God that's going to deal with the fear of man. I really It do. is. It is going to be the love of God. And when we all go back to it, when everything boils down, what we're going to be left with is his love because that is who he is. Yep. And Lisa, I can't imagine anyone more proficient at speaking to this. 
than you and you have truly awakened um i think through through your book through, well through all your books but i think um this really tackling this idea of the love of god and that's what pulls us that's what refines us that's what we can we can trust in i think it's going to change so many millions of lives so thank you thank you for your obedience well hannah thank you for inviting me on your podcast again and thank you for highlighting and having a passion for God's spirit's love. Thank you for having a passion for his holiness. Thank you for having a passion for his word. I love that it just comes out. And um, I, I, I just admire your tenacity. And um, thanks for letting me be part of your show. Oh, thank you so much. Guys, I'm telling you, when you can trust in that fierce love and know that he is not against you. He is for you. You can trust him. It's going to change your life. It's going to bless you like crazy.